Sometimes a console just isn't enough. Today I want to talk about one of my favorite add-ons of all time, the Famicom Disk System. It's an add-on for the Famicom that played games using proprietary floppy disks. And for a short time, Nintendo considered it the future of their system and company. The games were bigger and even cheaper for consumers, but ultimately advancements in technology quickly made the system obsolete. But that doesn't mean the disk system was bad. It was an impressive piece of hardware and had some great games. Many of the ideas it introduced and inspired were revolutionary. So let's dive into the history of the Famicom Disk System, what it was, why it was created, and how it failed. The year was 1985, and Nintendo's family computer system was on top of Japan's video game market. In just one and a half years, Nintendo sold more than three million systems, and there was no sign of slowing down. All across the country, retailers called Nintendo, asking for more product to satisfy consumer demands. One of the biggest demands was for cheaper games. Video game rentals were banned the previous year, which resulted in fewer options for playing games on a budget. But there was little Nintendo could do about the problem. Cartridges were expensive to make, thanks to the cost of semiconductors and chips. The average Famicom cartridge cost around $30 at the time, even simple games. That year, a company called Hudson Soft approached Nintendo about a possible new add-on for the Famicom, one that played games using their patented B cards. Hudson Soft had experimented with their cards on the MSX computer, but with the Famicom dominating the market, it made sense to pitch the technology to Nintendo. The cards were small, almost like a credit card, but had enough capacity to store full games. Once consumers got tired of the game, they could bring the card to a kiosk in a retail store and write a new game to the card. Nintendo loved the idea, especially the concept of overwriting existing games. But the technology was somewhat expensive, and they would be forced to pay royalties for every card sold. Nintendo ultimately decided to pass on Hudson Soft's proposal. This rejection eventually led Hudson Soft to partner with the NEC Corporation and create the PC Engine system also known as the Turbo Graphics in North America. It played games using Hue cards, an evolution of the B card. Nintendo continued to explore the idea of rewritable games. Luckily, there was a popular form of media that was absolutely perfect for their concept. Floppy disks. Floppy disks had been around since the 70s and had become the standard form of media for personal computers. They were cheap, could hold more data than cartridges, and most importantly, they were rewritable. Nintendo chose to use Mitsumi's Quick Disk as their media format. At the time, 5 and a quarter and 3 and a half inch floppies were the standard size. Mitsumi marketed their Quick Disks as a smaller, cheaper alternative that could be customized. Thus, development began on the Famicom Disk System, led by Masayuki Yamura and R&D2, the same team that designed the Famicom. On February 21st, 1986, after several delays, the Famicom Disk System was released. It retailed for 15,000 yen, which was around $80 at the time. To go along with the add-on, Nintendo released The Legend of Zelda, a massive adventure game that utilized all 128 kilobytes of their new disk media. Nintendo's marketing campaign featured a new mascot, a cute little yellow character known as Disk-kun, or Mr. Disk. The ads promised that all the best new games would only be available on the Famicom Disk System. It seemed as if Nintendo had gone all in with their new peripheral. Initially, the Famicom Disk System sold very well. Within three months, they sold 500,000 units. By the end of the year, that number jumped to 2 million. Let's dive into the hardware. The disk system came boxed with only three items. The disk system itself, the RAM adapter, and an RF cord. So you might be wondering, what about a power adapter? Well, those were actually sold separately. The disk system can be powered by six C batteries. Apparently, Nintendo thought people's outlets would be hogged by the TV and the Famicom. Surprisingly, the system lasts quite a while on batteries. The front of the disk system features the disk slot where you insert your games, and an access light to let you know when data is being read on the disk. The back of the system contains an AC adapter input and the RAM adapter input. The RAM adapter is the key to operating the disk system. 
It's responsible for sending all the data to the Famicom. On the back is a hidden parallel port. Nothing I know of utilizes this port, but it's possible Nintendo had plans to use it in the future, maybe for a system link cable or something. Inside the adapter is extra RAM for program and graphical data. There's also a special processor inside that controls the disk drive and provides an additional audio channel. This allowed for even more detailed music and sound effects in games. Listen for some of the differences between these games that came out on both a disc and a cartridge. Well, that's basically it. Overall, it's a very minimal add-on. It acts perfectly as a base to the Famicom and has matching red colors. Together, it's a pretty gorgeous setup. When you boot up the system, you are greeted with an iconic jingle along with some fun animations of Mario and Luigi. But the heart of any console is the games, and this is how Nintendo hoped to attract customers to the disc system. Games are stored on disc cards. Each side can hold 64 kilobytes of data for a total of 128 kilobytes. In some cases, a different game can be written on each side. My copy of Super Mario Bros. 2 has volleyball on side B, and the cover even has a space to let you write in what game is on each side. There is no plastic shutter to protect the magnetic disc. Instead, Nintendo put each game in a wax sleeve and clear plastic case, most likely to save money. Games that came on a blue disc did have the plastic shutter, but more on that later. There's also the word Nintendo recessed into every disc. While it may seem like a branding strategy, this was actually an anti-piracy measure. Inside the disc system was a stamp that fit snugly into these letters. If it didn't fit correctly, the game wouldn't play. While the upfront cost of the disc system was somewhat high, buying games for the system was relatively cheap. An average disc system game was between $15 and $20, while the average cartridge game cost $30. Nintendo also set up disc writer kiosks throughout retail stores in Japan. For only about $3, customers could write new games to their existing discs. An extra $1 would net you the manual. You could even buy a blank disc for about $12, then write a new game to it. It was a brilliant idea, and gave consumers more options to try new games. Nintendo even took it a step further by making an early form of online gaming. In 1987, they set up contests where players would compete for high scores on specific games. These games came on special blue discs with plastic shutters, and included titles such as F1 Race and 3D Hot Rally. Once you achieve a high score, you could bring in your disc to a disc fax machine at a retail store, where your score would be sent to Nintendo. Winners would receive exclusive prizes, such as a gold punch-out cart. Nintendo initially hoped the disc system would be a way for gamers to play casual games for less money. But when developers found out how much extra data they could put in their games, it became the future. Most cartridge games at the time were around 32 kilobytes, but thanks to the disc system, they could go up to 128 kilobytes. Players also now had the ability to save their games, which allowed developers to get even more creative. One developer, Yoshio Sakamoto of R&D 1, stated the disc system allowed them to create less stage-clear games, like Wrecking Crew or Mario Brothers, and create games on a larger scale. Nintendo even entered new genre territory by creating a few text-based adventure games, such as Famicom Detective Club and Time Twist. The disc system also gave developers more time to create games. Production of the actual discs took much less time than a cartridge. Kid Icarus was finished only three days before it was released. Nintendo promised that all future big releases would only be available on the Famicom disc system, and for a time, Nintendo wasn't kidding. From November 1985 to November of 1987, Nintendo didn't release a single cartridge game for the Famicom, only disc system games. Many classics debuted on the Famicom disc system. The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Kid Icarus, Doki Doki Panic, Castlevania, 
even the sequel to Super Mario Bros. was only available on the disc system. With all that being said, the Famicom disc system did have its flaws. Most consumers were used to simply putting in a cartridge and playing their game. Using the disc format introduced a whole new set of issues. The discs are fragile. Without any protective plastic shutter covering the magnetic disc, they collect dust and fingerprints, which can eventually make them unplayable. And because games were now on discs, consumers had to get used to a new concept. Loading times. Even the system had reliability issues, most notably the rubber drive belts that spun the discs, which would break over time. Many times you will boot up the disc system to a random error number with no explanation. And of course, all of the parts are proprietary, so getting replacement hardware is difficult. Overall, the Famicom Disk System is a great add-on for the Famicom that had tons of potential, but ultimately fell short. By 1990, most consumers and developers had moved on, and in total, Nintendo sold about 4.5 million units. So what went wrong? Well, quite a few things. Just four months after the Disk System launched, Capcom released Ghosts and Goblins on a massive 128 kilobyte cartridge, the first of its kind. Not only that, but semiconductor and chip prices were coming down, so making cartridge-based games wasn't such an expense anymore. When Nintendo brought the disc system game Legend of Zelda to the United States in cartridge form, they came up with a battery backup save feature. So by 1987, there were almost no advantages to having your game on a disc rather than a cartridge. Nintendo also introduced very strict licensing terms, which angered third-party licensees. If a company wanted a cartridge game converted to disc, Nintendo charged a hefty fee. They also claimed 50% copyright ownership of any disc system game, something cartridge-based games never had to worry about. There was also less money to be made in disc-based games. Retailers weren't thrilled either. While the disc rider kiosks were a fun idea, they took up a lot of room in stores, and had to be serviced regularly. Piracy was also an issue. Despite Nintendo's clever stamp on discs and various programming checks, people found a way to get around it all. One clever trick was to slightly modify the recessed Nintendo logo on discs. This not only worked, but avoided copyright issues, allowing pirated games to be sold in stores. Copying devices and bootleg games were so rampant, they were even advertised in magazines. Eventually, Nintendo admitted defeat and switched back to making cartridge games. They even took a few disc games like Legend of Zelda and converted them to cartridge form. Believe it or not, there were plans to release the disc system in the United States. Several patents were filed, but by the time they were approved in 1988, Nintendo had canceled plans to release the system stateside. Despite Nintendo pulling the plug on the disc system, it maintained quite a loyal following in Japan. Nintendo serviced the system all the way up to the year 2007, and even provided disc writing services all the way up to the year 2003. Today, it's a collector's piece for Famicom enthusiasts and has gained somewhat of a cult following. It requires a bit more attention due to the various hardware issues. Even buying software can be tricky, as games were overwritten constantly. You may think you are purchasing one game, but once you pop it into the system, find out it's something completely different. You can buy a Famicom disc system with a new drive belt for around $50 on eBay, but keep in mind you are also going to need a Famicom. If you want to get extra fancy, you can go for the Sharp Twin Famicom. When the disc system was released, Nintendo collaborated with Sharp and created the Sharp Twin Famicom, an all-in-one system that played both Famicom games and Famicom Disk System games. These go for a bit more, around $150. If getting a Famicom is just totally out of the question, the disc system does work using an NES top loader with a Famicom to NES cart converter. However, the enhanced audio doesn't work using this method. For more information, I highly recommend checking out FamicomDiscSystem.com. It's a great resource containing technical information, pictures, and more. That's all for this episode of Gaming Historian. Thanks for watching. Funding for Gaming Historian is provided in part by supporters on Patreon. Thank you.